All right, guys, I'm gonna make a quick video on puppy bite work and bite work for young dogs. So when I say puppy bite work, that's kind of a broad window for a dog. It could be a seven week old puppy we're talking about, or it could be a four month old, five month old puppy we're talking about. Uh, generally, puppy will fall in that category between about eight weeks of age to roughly about five months of age. Okay, six, seven, eight months of age, you don't have a puppy anymore, you have a young dog, okay? So if you're gonna be doing bite work with a young dog, so in the, in the range between eight, seven to a year, seven months of age to a year old, uh, you have a young dog. So what I'm gonna be talking about does definitely apply to them, but it's more specifically going to be dealing with puppies between eight weeks of age to roughly about five months of age. So a little bit of a disclaimer and that is that every training method out there could be effective if it is applied with skill and if it's applied with solid fundamentals. What I mean by that is it has to make sense. Uh, it, it has to be fair for the dog. It has to have a good reason behind every action. There is no wasted movement and everything has a purpose. Okay, There's so much misinformation out there in dog training, but especially in bite work. But when working with a puppy, you're working with even a young dog or even with an adult and you're teaching an adult how to do bite work and it's kind of new at it, you don't want to go in the fence work. You want to do this in prey work. You want to do this in predatory mode. What I mean is the fence work is usually more intimidating and it forces the dog to kind of uh, react on a defensive state. Whereas prey work is more fun. The dog is chasing. The dog is happy. The dog is frustrated, but it's still happy. And it's engaged in something that it really wants to do. So everything that we're gonna be teaching a young dog or a puppy is gonna be based on prey work because that's how they can think and that's how they can function and that's how they can progress while having fun. All right, so the methods that I'm gonna be describing, the equipment I'm gonna be going over and the reason behind what I'm gonna be doing is one way to do things. I don't claim it to be the only way to do things. I've actually learned this through several mentors, a lot of experience, and, uh, and hands-on work with the puppies, not just with adult dogs. So I'm gonna be going over some of the equipment, some of the, uh, some of the things to do, and how I do bite work with the puppies that I see on a constant basis, okay? So bite work for young dogs, and puppies has to be mechanical. What I mean by that is, it's not about teaching the dog to bite the real person. It's not about teaching the dog to be a, a crazy police dog or, or put that puppy or that young dog in realistic scenarios. This is a puppy, it's a young dog, and it's a green dog. We're not putting the whole picture together and presenting it to him and being like, okay, now figure it out. That's not what beginning basic bite work is about. Basic entry level bite work for these young green dogs is about forming good habits, okay? That's what it's about. It's about forming the right habits, which means this is gonna be very mechanical in nature. I need to have an idea of what I'm working with, what type of dog I'm looking at, and I need to be confident in my skill to be able to get the best out of that training session for that individual, okay? If I don't know how to do it, this is where there are gonna be problems. This is where we're gonna accidentally create some issues that we don't want. This is why training puppies does come with experience. And unfortunately, one of the things that you have to do is you're gonna to have to work with puppies when you don't have experience. This is something you're gonna to have to do to gain that experience. Um, now, hopefully this is not a, a, a long process for you to get better at something. So, so if you're kind of new at it, don't get bummed out. You just need to know a few basic fundamentals so that you can get started in the right step and make sure that you are doing it properly. Okay, so some equipment I'm gonna be going over uh, when I'm doing bite work with a puppy or a young dog 
is one very important right here, and that is the agitation collar. Okay, if you are going to be doing this in prey drive, this puppy is going to be excited. So you're going to have the handler holding onto the puppy. The puppy's going to be at the end of the leash, getting super excited, super pumped. And I want this puppy to be comfortable. So if you have this puppy on a, on a very thin ID collar, and this puppy's at the end of the leash, pulling and, and you know jolting itself, it's not going to feel good. It's going to not be comfortable. And potentially, it could cause some damage, some long-term damage, as the puppy just keeps lunging and pulling into this very thin collar and it has a very very fragile thin neck as it is so i don't want to do that okay so if i'm working with like a you know a, a seven week old puppy eight week old puppy you could probably use one of their little harnesses they're not pulling with a lot of intensity so the harness would probably do better than the little collar that they usually come with um, but as the puppy gets a little bit older now you're talking about a 12 weeks 12 week old puppy 14 week old puppy now you can start using an agitation collar. Same exact reason. I don't want this 12, 16 week old puppy, which now they have more intensity, they have more strength, they have more power and more speed. I don't want it to be at the end of the leash with that thin collar hurting itself and being uncomfortable because that could actually inhibit them a little bit. And I don't want the puppy inhibited during bite work. I want them to be very, very powerful. I want it to be very forward. So having an agitation collar that is the right size it'll fit them uh, normally something about two inches wide very stiff this particular one is made of biothane but you know they have some nice leather ones too and the principle is this as they are pulling into this collar because it's so thick and stiff it's not really tightening it and it's not really uh, stretching it and it's not making the neck uncomfortable with this thin little strap you have this very thick stiff uh, strap that is actually softening up the the pulling on the on the puppy uh, the other thing you have as an alternative to that is an agitation harness uh, the one thing i want to say about the agitation harness it is very unique from a, a, a from a harness that you're going to find at a pet store your average pet store the harnesses that they have there are not the best for protection work okay they're usually straps and if you just put one of those harnesses on a, on a young dog, they're gonna be pulling. It's certainly better than having just a, a really thin collar, but because they're just made of straps, what's happening is every time they're pulling, it's tightening it, tightening the, uh, the chest, the collarbone, the ribs, and it's just not the most comfortable thing. Whereas an agitation harness is specifically made for protection work specifically made for working dogs to be at the end of that leash pulling with a lot of intensity because all that intensity and all that power is going to be displaced by this nice stiff but comfortable and padded chest plate so an agitation harness has chest plates uh, and it has a couple of softly padded straps on the side that makes that pulling a lot more comfortable than just you know these thin straps okay so agitation harness is great the only disadvantage with agitation harnesses is that when you're working with a young dog typically they don't sell agitation harnesses for small dogs uh, it's just usually something you're going to get for an adult dog they come in a couple of different sizes but you're not really going to find that for the young dog another piece of equipment that is very important to have especially for a puppy is the uh the floor pole now the floor pole is it's just you can make this I actually made this this was a uh, uh, an igp uh whip just took the whip out kept the stick put some 550 cord on here and attached uh, a very thin leather leather rag to to the end of it now the reason why this is very effective is a lot of times you bring a puppy into the training area and they haven't really done bite work so this is kind of new to them you put them in and they're just looking at you like okay cool what are we doing so by me using the uh the floor pole i can trigger some of that prey drive okay without being too involved and too close to that puppy right i can just put that on the ground and i can move it around trigger some of that prey drive get that puppy to chase and get that puppy to start engaging, grabbing, biting, and now I can use this to teach the proper habits. Now I'm gonna take a little bit of a sidestep into grabbing, okay? 
every drivey dog, they have their own style of playing, okay? This is something that, that took me uh, some time to, to kind of realize, to pick up on, but I've noticed that dogs have their own unique preferred style of playing. This can be influenced by their genetics, right? We always want to have the right dog that was bred for the right purpose. But regardless of that, they'll have their own preferred style of playing with the toy. What some dogs want to do when they're puppies, this is very innate, very unique to them, is one of the things they want to do is they want to thrash. They want to grab the toy and just shake it, right? Um, and maybe gnaw on it. And then you have another type of dog that maybe, even from the same litter, that maybe that's not their preferred style of playing. Maybe their preferred style of playing is to grab, and if they, it's a little bit of a position, they just want to pull, 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 and keep pulling. And then you have a, preferred, a different preferred style of playing, which is the puppy or the dog will grab the toy, and they'll want to stuff as much of that toy into their mouth as possible, okay? So those are three different styles of playing. And some dogs have a preference for one of them, and some dogs will do all of them. So what I want to do is when I do bite work with the puppy, I want to encourage full mouth grips, and I want to encourage forward pushing grips, okay? That's what I'm interested in doing. So the puppy that wants to thrash, my job as a helper is to turn the game and facilitate it so that pushing instead of thrashing is more rewarding for that dog. That's how I'm gonna create the right habits because remember, doing bite work with young dogs is about teaching them the right habits, okay? Uh, if I have a dog that wants to pull, then what I wanna do is I want to facilitate the game into a process in which pushing feels more rewarding than just pulling, okay? And with the right skill, you can do that. If you don't know what you're doing, it can be a little bit difficult to do that. And now, obviously, if you have the puppy that prefers to stuff the toy into its mouth, that puppy is already doing 50 to 70% of the work for you. You just pretty much have to make sure that you don't mess it up. So some puppies definitely make the bite work training a little bit easier because they want to naturally swallow the entire toy. They naturally want to swallow the entire sleeve. And those dogs are freaking awesome. You have some dogs that don't want to do that. They prefer to get crazy with it, thrash it. Uh, and then with those dogs, you just have to work a little bit harder to teach them the right habits. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily crappy dogs. Maybe they're not the right genetic, um, they're not the right dog for what you want, but it doesn't mean that that's always the case. Sometimes they just don't know how to do it and they default to doing it the way that it feels right for them. So what I want to do is I want to teach them the right habits and let them know thrashing is really not that fun. Pushing into it, that's really fun, okay? So that's kind of the different styles of playing and my job as a helper, your job as a helper is to make sure that you let them know through your skill and your mechanics that pushing into it is fun. Okay, so the, the next thing, the last thing I wanna be covering for puppy bite work or young dog bite work is the puppy sleeve, okay? So puppy sleeve right here, uh, this is like one step above the rag. Uh, naturally, I don't wanna just keep the dog on a rag. If, if I'm gonna do, if I'm gonna be doing protection work with this puppy, uh, I don't wanna keep him on the rag. The goal is not to stay on the rag. The goal is not to stay on, on the puppy sleeve. The goal is to progress through every piece of equipment until they see the final picture. But the puppy sleeve is definitely a vehicle to get me there. Okay, so past the rag, I'm gonna use a puppy sleeve. Now here we have a couple of different types. We have a jute puppy sleeve and we have a synthetic puppy sleeve, okay? And uh, up until recently, um, you know, the past couple of years, to me, I always use synthetic. So the reasoning behind that, something that I have been taught too, is, you know, look, most sports out there, they're bite suit sports, right? Protection work wise. And so if they're protection sports that are going to be on bite suits and bite suits are made of synthetic material, you wanna use synthetic puppy sleeves. 
And if you're going to use, uh, if you're going to be participating in a sport that is going to be using jute as the material, then you want to use jute sleeves. And uh, that's what jute is. It's kind of ropey. So I never used jute puppy sleeves. I always used synthetic puppy sleeves. Now, there are a couple of sports where the bite suit is not made of, uh, you know, not made of synthetic material. Actually, only one, and that is Belgian ring. In Belgian ring, there is a synthetic bite suit, but the targeting areas for the sport are the forearm, which is made of jute, and the shins, which are also made of jute, right? The other sport where jute is the biting material for the dog is going to be IGP, or now American Schutzen. So I thought, well, I'm not doing any of those sports. I'm doing PSA, you know, and if you're doing French ring or Mondial ring, you're going to be seeing synthetic bite suits. So why not start with a synthetic puppy sleeve and work with synthetic sleeves all the way to the end? And that's certainly how a lot of people do it. That's how I did it. That's how I was taught to do it. That was the reasoning that I was given and it made sense to me. And then a couple of years ago, I uh, met a guy who's a good friend of mine now. His name is Joris from uh, Quadron Canine. And he is a Belgian ring guy. And uh, you know he does also do more than just Belgian ring. But one thing that he brought to my attention is that you know the jute sleeves, this was like new information to me, right? That the jute sleeves, they're not just for sports specific training. What the jute sleeves do is they actually help the dog, the young dog and the puppy have a fuller grip, okay? And I have now confirmed this I've seen it and I can definitely tell you this is not just theory. This isn't just what this guy said and you know it makes sense to him and that's his way of doing it. I did it, I applied it uh, because I wanted to test it out and I noticed that there was a difference. I noticed that the way in which these thoughts progressed made more sense and it, uh, it, it made it so that the transition was much easier for them. And so the the thing that he taught me was, you know, when you do bite work on young dogs, I mean, even when you're practicing and you're, you're trying to work on the grip and you're using synthetic material, what the synthetic material does is it's easier for the dog to slip, to slip the sleeve out of their mouth because it's synthetic, it's pretty slick. So as they're biting it, you do this, it pops right out of their mouth, right? So this is something that you can train them not to do, but what's happening is, they have to, um, you know, work a little bit harder. You know, obviously we work through this, right? This is how I've done it before I started using jute sleeves. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't a big deal. However, when I started using the jute sleeves, I saw a significant difference. I saw improvement. I saw the grips getting better. And now this is something that I implement into my training regimen when I'm working with young dogs. Okay, if I'm working with young dogs, or even green dogs, and I want to improve the grip, I'm gonna go right to jute. Because what happens with jute sleeves is uh, when the dog puts his mouth on it, when the puppy or the green dog, remember these are dogs that don't really know how to do this. We're, uh, we're trying to give them the right habits, the right set of mechanics. So by using a jute sleeve, it makes it harder for the sleeve to slip out of their mouth because this is very, very, um, it's very grippy for the dog's teeth. It, it's, it has the teeth sink on it a lot faster, a lot easier. So it, it, it ends up having a nice, nice grip um, when the dog is making contact. So by doing this, I can now have that puppy or that young dog have a nice full grip. It's not slipping. Uh, it actually has a, a, a nice firm hold on it. And now from here, once the grip improves, then I can transition, then I can transition to, the, to the synthetic sleeves. Okay, so now this is something that I use and, um, and it really has made a difference in my approach to training and I just firsthand I see it. I cannot deny it. I definitely see a huge improvement. So if you have not yet used a jute sleeve, um, as part of your development for your young green dogs and your puppies, I'm telling you, once you start using it, you will see that difference. And again, it's about using the right equipment to create the right habits 
so that then you can generalize that and take it to the final picture, okay? That's why we use equipment anyway, right? Equipment is to help us get there. Now, the other thing is I'm gonna be talking about technique and presentation, uh, the technique for the handler. There's a couple of things that we, we want to do and a couple of things that I do based on the individual training session um, that I do for that particular dog is I'll either have the handler post up. So when, when I tell the handler post up, they know that they are a tree. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm creating the tension. They're not moving back and forth. They're actually a tree. They're posting right up, right? And I'm creating the tension and I'm creating the slack. I'm creating the tension and I'm creating the slack. I'm moving back and forth, right? Moving left to right within that radius, but I'm creating the tension, I'm creating the slack. And what this does is it turns this into a game of, hey, I'm about to take it from you. Slack, oh no, you're not gonna take it from me. So it makes the dog push into it a little bit farther, a little bit deeper, right? So it's this constant uh, little bit of a struggle of, I know you want this, but it might go away. That's when I create the tension. I create the slack, dog goes, no, you're not. And it gives, gives me a nice full grip. The other technique too, is to do a little bit different than that, in which the handler is not a tree. I'll take the bite, and what I'll do is I'll just keep moving backwards and I'll keep the dog engaged. I'm not just floating around with the dog. I'm constantly moving backwards and I'm constantly moving the sleeve. And the reasoning behind that is it keeps the dog forward, okay? So the dog doesn't have time to think, oh crap, I wanna thrash it, or you know, crap, I want to pull it. The dog now has to keep up with me. So as I'm moving backwards and I'm moving the sleeve back and forth, I'm keeping the toy alive. I'm keeping the, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm giving the sleeve some heartbeat by moving my arm back and forth. What's happening now is I'm keeping it alive, but I'm also moving backwards. This puppy now has to come forward to stay with that firm grip. Okay, so he has no time to thrash or pull because I'm still moving backwards. If he starts pulling, I'm gonna win. And then this game is just not gonna be as fun anymore. So if I just keep moving backwards, I keep the toy alive, the dog is now wanting to come forward, I'm petting the dog, I'm getting him really excited about the game, and he's winning, he's getting to enjoy the toy, and he's working with this little prey item that is still alive and is still you know, moving, okay? So the, those are a couple of techniques that I really like to use, not only on puppies and young dogs, but I'll even use it on adult dogs. It works really, really great. So those two techniques are pretty much what's gonna happen, right? Unless the dog is a little bit more advanced and uh, we can have the dog without the handler. So it's just basically the helper and the dog. And now I'm still working the dog and I'm still trying to encourage that full deep grip, okay? Presentation wise, you know, once we get past the rag, past the flirt pole, uh, and once I've decided, okay, I'm gonna start using one of the puppy sleeves, maybe first I'll start with it as a tug, and then very quickly, I'm gonna put it on as a sleeve. So two couple of presentations, a couple of presentations that I have is I'm gonna do my, my forearm like this, right, so my palm facing down. So I'm gonna work with that puppy, right? I'm gonna work back and forth, I'm gonna pet him, moving, I'm gonna create that tension. If the, if the handler is a tree, I'm gonna come in, or if I'm moving back and forth, if I'm moving backwards, I'm gonna keep moving backwards and I'm gonna keep working with the dog. My body pressure is going to depend on what that puppy's given me. So if he's giving me a lot of power, maybe I'll be a little bit more forward and pet him and encourage him. If he is a little bit, uh, you know, holding back a little bit, then I'll kind of turn sideways. And as I'm turning sideways, now I'm more of a flea mode, a little bit more submissive, and now I'm giving the puppy all that power. Okay, the other technique is I can present with my forearm facing up. Okay, forearm facing up. This gives me a little bit more spatial pressure on the puppy, but it also gives me more control. So I have more flexibility on that puppy. I can use my other hand to use opposition reflex to get the dog to push deeper into the bite. What I mean by opposition reflex, if you haven't heard of that yet, is the pressure that you apply to opposing pressure so for instance if somebody pushes you you don't just go oh well i'm falling right if somebody pushes you you're automatically uh compensating for that pressure by pushing forward if somebody pulls you you're automatically compensating for that by pulling in the opposite direction so that's opposition reflex 
and it's a great tool to use on young dogs to get them to have a full grip. So what I do with them is, as they're on the bite, right, so they're on the bite, and I want them to have a forward, fuller grip, what I'll do is I'll grab their forehead with my other hand, and I'll push them away slightly, so I'm creating that opposition reflex, I'm, I'm triggering that, and naturally as I'm pushing them away, they go, well, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna go away. Now I need to push forward because you're pushing me away and then I let go and they come in farther forward. Okay, so I can do that and, and you'll see it on a bunch of my videos. If you go to the YouTube channel, um, if this is where you're watching and you go to my playlist and you go to the bite work playlist, it's just nothing but bite work videos there. You'll see that in most of those videos, as I'm working with the younger dogs and even the adult dogs, you'll see that I'm up, using opposition reflex and I'm pushing them to create that forward movement and that's exactly what I'm talking about. So that's what I want to do to have them push forward, have a fuller grip and get them more and more confident. So those are a couple of techniques. That's the equipment. Now naturally these puppies are not going to be puppies their entire lives. Uh, they are going to get bigger and as you do bite work their jaws are getting stronger. So as they get stronger now you're gonna need to use something a little bit uh, extra here because this puppy gets a little bit older, jaw gets a little bit bigger, just that puppy sleeve, which doesn't really protect you a whole lot. All right, that's gonna get very painful. And so using a neoprene gauntlet gives you that extra bit of protection when you're still working with a puppy, but uh, you know they're not quite at that transition level where they can go to a, a higher level, level sleeve. Um, and then just like I said, you know, puppies are not going to stay puppies. At some point, they're going to get bigger. At some point, they are going to be young dogs. And the goal is not to keep them on a puppy sleeve. The goal is to progress. So I'm going to progress to something else. And puppy sleeve is not going to be it. Now, if I'm working with a green young dog or an adult dog that doesn't have a whole lot of bite work, you probably want to skip the puppy sleeve. You really want to consider using this with an adult dog because this could really be painful. Uh, it, you could get injured. You know, this looks like it protects you, but it really doesn't. It's a puppy sleeve for a reason. If you use a puppy sleeve on a, you know, on a 40 pound, 50 pound adult dog, 60 pound adult dog, that could easily turn into a fracture for your arm. So. You want to make sure you use the right equipment. Puppy sleeve, I'm going to be using for anywhere between 14 weeks of age, maybe, uh, to maybe about six months of age, maybe, maybe six months of age, depending on the size of the dog. And then after that, or very quickly past that, I'm going to get to a higher level sleeve. And again, I will vary it. I will go from a, a jute sleeve to a synthetic sleeve based on what I need to get out of that dog. So if you like this video, make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you follow me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and I'm also on a podcast. So if you go to Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, or other platforms, you can find me on there as well. And I'll see you on the next video.